Um, I'm Glenn Pedrick. I'm a um, consulting engineer with Mineheart Australia. And I'm here today to talk about how vertical transportation is helping us to transform the modern city. Um, elevators are becoming faster, more energy efficient, and easier to use. The technologies um, in elevators make buildings more efficient and allow taller construction every year. In today's paper, I'm going to use case studies to demonstrate how these new technologies um, operate in buildings, uh, when to use them, and the benefits that are available for, for building developers. Oh, no. The first elevator was invented a long time ago, in 236 BC by Archimedes. It was a simple device with ropes and pulleys, and it was powered by either man or horses. The first passenger elevator was installed in Versailles Palace in 1743 by King Louis XV. He sat in the little chair there and pulled on the rope to transport himself up or down. He had it installed just near his bedroom and it was used so he could secretly visit his mistress. But primarily um, elevators in the olden days were used for transport of goods because of safety concerns. Elisha Otis was a sawmill manager in 1851 who was given the problem of moving some debris in his factory from the lower level to the upper level. He thought of using a traditional hoist, but realised they were unsafe and unreliable. So being a bit of a part-time inventor, he created a safety device so that the hoist wouldn't fail and fall down. Having successfully completed moving all the debris in his factory, he didn't really think much about his device and didn't worry about it too much. See, so he'd already invented other things. He'd invented a, a, robot, a robot bed making device for turning bedposts accurately and efficiently, a train safety brake for making trains safer, and an automatic bread baking oven. However, on reflection, Oda started to feel a bit better about his invention and famously decided to exhibit it in 1854 in the New York World Fair. That's Otis up there standing on the platform. And um, you can see above him the ropes failed. The uh, axeman actually cut the rope and Otis didn't fall. So he was safe and everybody loved his product and the Otis Elevator Company began. And that's the real start of passenger elevators. I guess back in 1851, Otis didn't really understand what he'd done. He didn't really understand the significance of his invention. The main reason was, this is what the world looked like back in 1851. That's New York in 18, around the 1860s. Not a lot of use for elevators, really. <laughs> the, the world's population um, in 1851, when Otis did that, was 1.2 billion people. The, the population of the world's multiplied by a factor of six since then. It's now home to 7.2 billion people. As, land, as our population grows every year, land becomes more scarce, which causes this. This is the same area, the same photograph from the same spot in 2013. Hong Kong's now home to 7.1 million people. Hong Kong's been able to achieve getting that many more people onto the same area of land by building tall buildings. Hong Kong's the home of the tall building. They currently have over 2,300 buildings that are higher than 30 storeys. And of course, none of that was possible without Otis's invention. Modern elevators have become fast, efficient, energy efficient, and they don't use as much space as they used to. Elevators are an everyday part of our lives. Every, year, every day, there are seven billion elevator journeys taken in the world somewhere. That's the equivalent of one person in the world taking an elevator journey once every day. Of course, elevators are a lot better than they used to be. The first Otis elevator was installed in 488 Broadway, New York, in 1857, and it travelled at a speed of 0.2 metres a second. Modern elevators are more than 80 times faster than that. The high-speed elevators in Taipei 101 travel at 16.8 metres per second, or, or over 60 kilometres an hour. Now, let's see whether the simulation works of the, the various speed of the elevators. Let's see. There's the fast lift. Yeah, the, the one in Broadway hasn't moved yet. It'll get there eventually. <laughs> Here it goes. <laughs> I'm 
I'll go to the next slide. <laughs> they had a lot of fun doing that back at the office. <laughs> so speed's been the main technology driver to allow us to build tall buildings. Um, one of the other drivers has been controls. Oh, I've started that slide already, sorry. Modern controls are much better than early controls. The early elevators were manually driven by an attendant. A guy sat in the lift and determined the best possible scenario for each lift in his mind every day, I'm sure. Now elevators are, are automatically controlled with sophisticated electronic controls. Like full collective control, dynamic sectoring, fuzzy logic, all the stuff these guys come up with. The most common one is destination dispatch or hall call allocation. And um, with that, people enter their destination at a lobby and they're assigned the, the lift car to travel to. And what that achieves in terms of the efficiency of the lift system is it allows people with the same destination to be assigned to the same lift car. So every time the lift car takes a journey, it's actually a quicker journey because it stops less. To simulate that, I've already run the simulation, right? Um, but this, is a, this was a case study for a 10-storey building um, with four elevators in it. On the left was a, an elevate study we did for um, a conventional collective control. And on the right was a, a destination dispatch simulation. We ran at about a 15% um, occupancy coming into the lobby. So we tried to get a lot of people into the building. What we found was that with the collective, sorry, with the collective control, um, at the average waiting time was something like 170 seconds or, or three minutes. Whereas on the right-hand side with the destination dispatch, it was around 53 seconds or 70% lower. Um, similarly, the, the average time to destination, which is the time from when you press the button until you arrive at your destination floor, was halved. So in a, in a situation like this with high traffic usage, destination dispatch provides a really good solution to help, with the, to help improve the efficiency of the lift system. Um, Lifts have become much more energy efficient than they used to be. Between 5 and 15% of an elevator's energy use is through the lift system. Um, modern variable voltage, variable frequency drives use 70 or 80% less energy than the old hydraulic drives they replace. If you use regenerative drives, which is a, another new technology, they, they use the, downward en journey, the, downward, the energy from the downward journey of the elevator to regenerate energy and can create another 30% of energy savings. Um, this is a Kone graphic. Thanks, thanks guys, for being there. And um, it shows that for a, for a 2,000 kilogram monospace lift in a 10-storey building, the, the, on the left is the, the standard e-coefficient elevator, and on the right is the same elevator with the regenerative drive. And it shows that the energy savings per annum are around 27%. What that means is that the regenerative drive pays for itself in about two years, and after that payback period, you just get more energy efficient building. Other things you can do to, 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 to save energy in lifts are switching off the car lights when they're not being used, putting in more efficient lighting, like LED lighting, um, and powering down lifts when they're not being run at all. So lifts are becoming more and more energy efficient as well as faster. Something we've all spoken about already is double deck. My thunder's been stolen a little bit already by question time. But um, double deck elevators are basically two elevators, one on top of each other. Um, so the advantage of them is that you can get twice as, people up, twice as many people up in one journey. Um, in the old days, they, they've been around for a long time, but in the old days, they used to operate on an odd and even basis, and that meant that they um, operated... That, one deck stopped on an odd floor, the other deck stopped on an even floor. So you had to, at the main entry lobby, you had to enter at either the, the correct floor to get to your odd or even floor up the top. And one of the reasons they went out of fashion was because of what's called non-coincident stops, is where um, the lift is stopping, one of the two cars is stopping so people can get in or out, but the people in the other car are, are sitting there staring at a stopped lift. And people found that disconcerting... Um, and felt uncomfortable with that. So they sort of, and it's not very efficient either. So for that reason, they sort of went out of vogue. But now with destination dispatch or hall call allocation, we can assign people to the right lift car and 
greatly reduce the number of non-coincident stops. So that problem has been reduced a lot. So now Double Deck provides a really good solution for, for, um, for, for efficiency. This building is a Broadgate Tower in London, which is one of the buildings that, that Kone did, um, one of the first ones, I think, with Double Deck Destination Dispatch. The other technology we spoke about is Twin. Up the back, we can run the, the film of Twin. This is, uh, Twin is basically two independent elevators in the same shaft, um, pioneered by Chisholm Crook. Sorry, I, I lifted the film without asking you. Sorry, Patrick. Um, the advantage of Twin is that you get twice as many elevators in the same shaft. So you get to move them around. Um, so Patrick's already been through all the, the safety devices. That was, so you pinched that bit of my presentation. That, um, the whole call allocation or the destination dispatch is a critical part of the, of the operation. And you have to be in one of the two cars. You have to be in destination dispatch to assign yourself to the correct car. Unlike um, Double Deck, Twin can work off a single height lobby. In the, in the main triangle building, there is a single height lobby. And the, the lower car hides in the, in the basement when the upper car fills, then the upper car moves up. Then the lower car comes up from the basement and fills and moves up. So it does have that ability to load, but, it, but it's not as efficient as, as a double height lobby, which are becoming more into vogue. Um, Similarly, because Twins two lifts, it's probably suitable for a wider range of, of building uses. Um, we've seen them being offered up potentially for sort of residential buildings, mixed-use buildings, hotels, offices. So I'd like to run through a couple of case studies to demonstrate these technologies. First case study is a, an old Meinhardt building, the Rialto South Tower in Melbourne. This uh, is a 54-storey building in the Collins Street end of Melbourne. And it was constructed in the 1980s and topped out in 1986. Um, so it's been there for 30 years. It comprises, at the moment it comprises, I don't think it's going to change for a while, I guess. It comprises four elevator services. Uh, a low rise service serving levels one to 12 um, with four elevators. A mid rise service serving levels 12 to 24 with five elevators, a high-rise service serving 24 to 37 with five elevators, and a sky-rise service with six elevators doing 37 up to the top. So we, we thought to ourselves, well, and that's a picture of the, the lift core there of how the building looks at the moment, except that's a floor plan, obviously. So we thought to ourselves, well, if we were designing this building today and we wanted the same level of performance, what technology could we use to make it more efficient? And we, we used the, the double deck destination dispatch technology to, to provide an equivalent level of service. Um, with the double deck destination dispatch, we found that we only need 12 double deck elevators. There's a, a low rise bank of, of six double deck elevators which serve between levels one and 29 and a high rise bank of six double deck elevators which serve 29 to 54. So the, the new lift core looks a fair bit different to the old one and a fair bit smaller. So these are the benefits of, of going to this technology for this building. We've got eight less elevators um, and eight less elevator shafts and a total floor area saving across the whole building of around 2,850 square metres, which comes up to almost three, areas of flo three floors worth of floor area. Um, Melbourne, Melbourne property currently rents for about $475 a square metre. So if we get full value for it, that becomes an additional $1.35 million of rent every year, assuming we can rent it. And Melbourne property is currently valued about $10,000 a square metre, making potentially the additional value of the building around $28 million by using a, a different lifting technology. For the next case study, I picked something that's a bit closer to here. It's the um, Pudong Kerry Hotel in, in Shanghai. And um, I'm not staying there, I'm staying here, by the way. Um, the, the, the Pudong Kerry has, is, is a, a development with three towers. There's a hotel tower, an office tower, and a service department tower. 
But for this case study, we're only looking at the hotel tower. The hotel tower has um, lower lobby, uh, restaurant and function rooms through levels two and three and four, and 600 luxury hotel rooms on level seven to 31. So we put our mind to how could we make this lift service more efficient? The existing hotel service has six elevator lifts, six elevators, sorry, which are conventional. And for this building, we looked at a, at a twin design. One of the reasons is because twin has independent lifts within the shafts, it's better able to move and, and fluctuate and respond to different types of response. So it can handle up peaks and down peaks better than a, a, a double deck installation. So with the twin alternative twin design, we managed to fit eight passenger elevators into four shafts. So in fact, we've got more elevators, but just less shafts. And it provides an equivalent level of performance. So for this job, we have two less elevator shafts. We have uh, a smaller lift lobby. And the total area we were able to gain by those reductions was around 830 square metres of floor area, um, which is about the same as about an extra 20 hotel rooms in the development. So there are fairly substantial gains to be made with these technologies. For the third case study, we had a go at doing a, a mixed-use building, which is just a hypothetical building we developed. It's, um, it has um, foyers in the lower ground and office. Um, it has hotel rooms. It has 800 luxury hotel rooms between levels 2 and 34, and offices in levels 36 to 50, about 18,750 square metres of offices. Using a traditional design solution, this is something like what the, the lift core would look on the right. There'd be um, eight passenger elevators to do the, the offices up on levels 36 to 50, um, about eight passenger lifts to do the hotel, which is between level two and 34, comprising about a total of 16 passenger elevators. On, on the right-hand side, there's a, a service lift core for, for the building. So we come up with a, an idea that of putting the, the office lifts on top of the, the hotel lifts with a twin arrangement. We, we, with this design, there are now 16 passenger elevators. There are still 16 elevators, but they're in eight shafts. The service lift core hasn't changed at all. The, the advantage of um, something like this is that the the 16 elevators are available for use. This, this assumes that we're sharing the 16 elevators between both uses, so that those 16 elevators are available for either the offices or the hotels. And one of the advantages can be at different times of the day, a, a lot of elevators are available. And again, the area benefits can be substantial. Um, in this case, there, there's eight less elevator shafts um, about 3,900 square metres of floor area gain and about three floors of additional area. So in conclusion, um, these new lift technologies are making a real difference in making buildings more efficient and allowing taller buildings. Um, they're making travel more economically sustainable and more energy efficient. And... Um, the last statement is just a factor of where we are with elevators today. There's, there's now 250 million elevators in use around the world. Right. Thank you.